happy to uh, introduce Martin Odersky for this interview. He's a professor of computer science in, at EPFL in Lausanne, and he's well known for being the creator and designer of the Scala programming language. So, welcome. Thank you. Um, so, my first question is, so Scala is a programming language, so, but there are many programming languages out there, so what do you think sets Scala as a language apart? Well, one thing that uh, Scala is about is really the fusion of object-oriented and functional programming. So it was probably the first language that took this very seriously in a statically typed setting. So I would say objects, functions, static types. In this triangle, that's where, where, where Scala is and uh, where Scala tries to do cool stuff and innovate. Okay, interesting. So there are many languages maybe not like Scala, but designed in, in the context of academia. And Scala is designed in academia, uh, but Scala is very successful. So how did you do it? Well, <clears throat> I think a, a large part of that is luck, mm -hmm. uh, or you could say timing. So when I started with Scala, the uh, Java that was in, about 2000 Java was really the the top of at the top of its popularity is sort of the one programming language that everybody moved to. And, but I knew that the pendulum would swing and that uh, said, well, the time to start is now so that by maybe 2005, we have an alternative for, to what Java is. And that actually turned out to be true. So you have to sort of start well in advance. And also you have to essentially have something that really provides additional value. And that, so essentially it's an equation to say, well, how big is the cost of migration and how big is the additional value that you provide? And that, that difference has to be positive for a language to, to, to gain any adoption. And of course, initially, the adoption, uh, the, the cost of migrating to a new language is very, very high because uh, there wouldn't be libraries, there wouldn't be good tools and things like that. So essentially, the, the initial one, you really have to, so, to offer something that, that, that is very important for the early adopters. And afterwards, that changes. So afterwards, you have to offer essentially uh, advantages overall and solid tooling and solid libraries and all this. So if you compare it to Java, um, so Java is a very mainstream language. It's used in many domains. Um, do you consider Scala to also be a mainstream language, or is, are there particular niches where Scala really shines? I think it's about as mainstream as Java is. Uh, it's not exactly the same focus, so, but there's a very large overlap. So I would say that uh, the, the specific uh, uh, focus of Scala, where Java is not as strong, is in data analytics, data science. Uh, so there, Scala is indeed very popular, and it's competing mostly with Python and R, less so with Java. And that the specific area where, where Scala is actually fairly... Uh, uh, weak or not not as popular is uh, I would say maybe Android. Even though there are good Android solutions, uh, most programmers don't actually go go to Scala and stay more on Java or maybe on other languages like Kotlin. Okay, thank you. So one thing that Scala has been known for is that it's not afraid to change things, right? In the language design, or uh, and I believe now you're redesigning the compiler and there's a new Scala center, so lots of activity around Scala. Can you briefly describe what is happening in the Scala world uh, today? Sure, so uh, I think there were sort of phases. So initially, indeed, Scala changed quite quickly, and that was just a, 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 a consequence of how it, where, it, where it started, where it got created, it got started in my, my gr research group at EPFL, so it was mostly grad students and some postdocs who were driving the issue. And so there was essentially the synthesis that uh, we, the students wanted to have new results and publishable results, and at the same time, we had to try to make it practical. Sounds like a recipe of di for disaster, and we definitely had our, our, uh, our thoughts there, but overall it actually succeeded uh, amazingly well. Uh, then came a period of consolidation that's maybe the last four or five years where really nothing much has changed except that uh, we uh, worked a lot on the tools. So I think, the, for instance, the incremental compiler is now much better than before. The IDEs are much better than before. And the only big changes were all labeled experimental. That was mostly the macro system reflection and the macro system where we said specifically, well, this is experimental and uh, so we uh, reserve the right to change it down the road. That didn't prevent people from using it, but still. So that, that was the, the situation there. 
And now uh, what we do in, again at EPFL is, is sort of a strategy to try to make a big jump. Uh, so to have a different code base, the .NET compiler, in which we can essentially iterate much faster new, new versions, new ideas, uh, try to again get something that is uh, essentially where the cost, the benefits hopefully will outweigh the cost of migrating. Mm -hmm. So in order to get there, we have to make the cost of migrating very, very low. So we invest heavily in rewrite tools that can essentially take your old source and rewrite it to the new standard. So that will be a, an essential part of the equation here. I can imagine that the, the large um, number of commercial parties actually uh, buying into Scala now uh, are a sort of force that sort of uh, influences what you can change and how fast you can change. Uh, do you experience any sp special impact from your commercial user base uh, on the evolution of the language? Uh, sure. So there's definitely a break to change. So I think a, a large reason for the consolidation was that Essentially, industry, that's what industry wanted. They, they didn't really, they were, they were afraid of uh, changes that were too often and too fast. Um, also, to give the tools time to catch up. So that's also important because there's a demand and to some degree also the funding to really improve the tools. So uh, I think without a lot of uh, industry uh, interest, probably IntelliJ, so JetBrains wouldn't have invested so heavily mm -hmm. in the IntelliJ plugin and IntelliJ is now a quite capable IDE and I think the, the Eclipse, uh, Scala IDE on Eclipse is also quite capable and also the, the, all these things, they, they are there because there is industrial demand. Uh, we also got specifically for the rewriting tool for the new version that was selling industry specifically demanded and is also funding actually. So that will be in the Scala Center. We have an advisory board where two of the largest users of Scala, so both of them said they had uh, about $15 billion of business writing of Scala, each, each one of them. And they said, well, we really have to make sure it's going to stick around and uh, that our code base will be portable. So. Uh, we want to lobby you to actually take this very seriously. And so we, we, we decided to invest in this rewrite tool and hopefully it will work out. So uh, you already mentioned it, the Scala Center. This is a recent uh, institute, right? It just started uh, it this started year? This year, that's right. So the Scala Center got started because of, essentially it has two missions. One is we had these um, massive open online courses on Scala, which uh, for now there are three. There are more coming out uh, very, very soon now. And we have so far over 600,000 uh, subscriptions to these courses, so over 600,000 uh, users uh, registered for the courses. And then maybe some of them registered twice or something, but still. Uh, so somebody had to take that over. It's, uh, the, these courses are largely automated, of course, but still there has to be somebody to hold the user's hands, to essentially watch out for the forums, what happens there, and these things. <coughs> and you can't do that with essentially just uh, student assistance because it's not in their interest, really. So that was, that's one of the uh, missions of the Scala Center, to take that over. And the other part is the open source software where Scala is in the language space relatively unique because it doesn't really have a large corporate sponsor that essentially defines what the language is. There is a small company that I co-founded, Lightband, that does to some degree that role, but really what they want to do and what they see their role is really mostly maintaining the, the standard Scala compiler, so essentially make sure that the tools or that the core tools work okay. And in terms of the community work, so how do you discover libraries, what to do about Scala.js, how to, to write, maybe join resources to create a new platform, that we found it would be better to be done on a non-commercial basis. So the setup is that we have by now, I think, about 10 companies that are all members of the essentially board that, fu that fund uh, the Scala Center to a, to a big part and they essentially make suggestions what the Scala Center should do. The community can also make suggestions and then to the limit of the resources that we have, we try to essentially do something that benefits everyone. So typically it's not that we want to do a particular thing for a particular interest, so we, want, we look at things that are really essentially transversal that, that everybody can profit from. Okay. Nice. So. Final question, what is the thing in the language design or in the ecosystem about Scala that will be new 
or changing that you're most excited about? Well, that's a hard call. So um, in the new one, uh, it's something that is actually a super tiny uh, extension. Uh, it's that we will uh, let you abstract over implicit uh, function types. So we have implicit parameters. Um, and so far, implicit parameters were essentially there was no way to abstract over them. That means to essentially take something that involves them, name it, use only the name afterwards. And uh, in, the new, in the new version of Scala that is backed by the .E compiler, that will be changed. And I foresee uh, a lot of follow-up work. So this looks like a completely innocuous and small change, but it will essentially give us the fundamental tool to abstract over contexts, which was, which was missing so far. Thank you very much. This was Martin Odersky for Release OpenL.